Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to the Seattle Science Foundation Tuesday Night Journal Club. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here tonight and to be hosting this with our five current fellows, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves as we get through the evening. I'm going to share with you some of the work that we've been doing with respect to robotics and navigation at Texas Back Institute. Uh, those of you who, who know me know that I've been involved in this in the, for quite some time now. So we're going to talk about the robotic spine program and go from genesis to current advanced applications. And I'm going to have the, the fellows present various cases where robotics and navigation have uh, really helped in terms of the... The promise of new technology is a faster recovery, more efficient surgery, less collateral tissue damage, uh, reduced morbidity, uh, reduced blood loss and infection rates. We want to try to arrest the deterioration of the spinal pathology. Uh, in certain circumstances, we're now trying to promote regeneration. But ultimately, what all this new technology is meant to do is improve our patient outcome allow us to serve our patients better than we are right now. Now, we've seen a lot of health innovations come and go over the last number of years, but we know that innovations drives growth, and growth transforms yesterday's luxuries into what are today's amenities. And I know that there are a number of uh, the panelists and probably individuals in, in the audience that remember the cell phones a few years ago that were just giant bricks that we used to carry around. Uh, so now we've got these luxuries and more computing power and today's amenities are providing for more uh, uh, efficient health care, less expensive health care and improved outcomes with it. Now, as spine surgeons, it's all about being in control. We know that this poor guy is going to have a rough landing. We don't ever want to feel like this at the time of surgery where the wheels are falling off and we know we're not going to have a smooth outcome with it. And likewise, for years in spine surgery, we've been measuring with a micrometer, but when it comes to actually executing surgery, we're using a chainsaw. And I like to say that in life, there are a lot of lumpers and splitters, and we've created all these lines and angles and cuts and different things. But really, we haven't had the tools up until very recently to be as precise and efficient as we anticipated. And a frequent thing that I also tell fellows and the residents that I've worked with is that the decision is always more important than the incision. And this is where the preoperative planning comes in. This is where talking to the patients come in and evaluating all the aspects of the surgery itself. So robotics is here to stay. It's a part of life. Automation, that's really what, what this is. Uh, whenever or when we used to travel, our, our luggage was sorted by a robot to get onto the right plane. The cell phones that we use are now pretty much manufactured on robotic assembly lines. So this technology is here to stay. And we really have been slow in adopting automation into the operating room. And there are many different ways that it can happen. Uh, there's semi-active, active robots now. Uh, there's multiple different platforms. But this is really where it started. And this is in 2002. Professor Moshe Shoam from the Technion University and myself, we wrote this first grant looking at uh, or trying to get funding for robotics within spinal surgery. And as the story goes, the night before this grant was due, the chairman of our department at the time calls me up and says, Izzy, I need uh, a grant for robotics and spine surgery. We've got $2 million on the table. Can you please put something together? And I said, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll start working on it. And he says, well, you don't understand. Uh, I, this was a Tuesday night. We need it on, on for tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, and you have it on my desk. And I said, no, that's, that's not going to happen. How am I going to write a grant and I got a full OR list tomorrow? It's just not going to work. And he asked me to put three pages together. And, and these are the first two of the three pages. And the case that I was doing the next morning was translaminar facet screws. 
I figured, wouldn't that be a great way to, to be able to apply those screws? So this is really where it all started. And Professor Shoham was really the, the heart and soul. But it's kind of evolved. It's gone from the three different systems that you see there, where we had a parallel manipulator, we had a fancy um, graphic user interface in the next generation, and then we got our final robot with the robotic arm and the navigation and guidance all built into it. And here was the evolution that you guys have probably all seen to what we are currently using today and able to really be much more efficient with the surgery that we're going for. But there are still a number of subtleties between the navigation and the robotics itself. And this is something that I like to, to emphasize and, and show the examples, especially when I've got that upper right picture of the space shuttle with the Canada arm up there. So navigation is really uh, a line of sight where you are moving something and it's pointing you in the right direction. But it's still in a virtual environment at the time of surgery where you're looking up at a screen. And the term robotics has become generalized where we've got now robotic arms that are navigated into position, as opposed to the guided arms where we preoperatively plan where we want that arm to be. And now there's a lot of new technology that's coming around that really can do both. And that's what we've seen. Uh, and from day one, I've maintained that we are in a very privileged position. There's all this technology on the shelf that's being used in multiple different industries. We just have to figure out how to integrate it, how to take the best of each technology, how to use navigation, how to use guidance. And right now, what I'm very excited about is a lot of the virtual augmentation and virtual reality that we're seeing. The technology will change the way we do surgery. I have no doubt about it. We are only limited by our imagination right now. And these were the first two steps in what's probably gonna be a multi-step process. And I know that 10 years ago, looking forward, I thought all of this stuff was science fiction. But I know 10 years from now, looking back, I'm gonna say, boy, were we primitive with what we were doing because there is so much more technology that we can really take advantage of. Now, this is what robotic surgery has done for me over my span as a surgeon. It's really allowed me to boldly go where no spine surgeon has gone before. I can now do things that I was not able to do a number of years ago. And it's because of the precision, the efficiency, and most importantly, the single most important lesson that I learned over the 18 years here is preoperative planning. Now in the operating room, when you're integrating new technology, if you implement it too early or you use the wrong technology or you implement too much technology, you end up with an inefficient operating room, unnecessary cost, and a lost opportunity. And the opposite balance is if you don't use all that technology, you wait too long to implement it, again, you have an inefficient operating room with unnecessary cost and a lost opportunity. So this leads us to the preoperative planning, which I feel really makes the operating room efficient. If you were to go on an airplane and you heard that the pilot didn't do his preoperative plan, his preoperative flight plan, and look at the weather ahead, look at the payload, look at how much fuel, would anyone get on that plane with him? No, but as surgeons, we put up an x-ray, we say, I'm gonna put a screw here, cut here, do this, do that. And we have this plan in our mind, but we never really documented the plan. And what we executed in the operating room was always a little different than what came about with it. And in one of the cases, we're gonna show you the accuracy of the planning and how we've been able to evolve through that and why it is so important under these regards. Now, this is a video and let's see if it's gonna work now. This is an example of the preoperative planning for a degenerative scoliosis at the L4-5 level. The first step in the planning is to mark the region of interest to tell the software where you're going to be operating. Typically, I will use one level above 
and one level below and just mark the region and then close the window down to just the CT information that we need. Once we've got our region of interest, we have to approve the orientation. So this is clearly anterior, this is posterior, this is the left side here and the right side over here. The next step is to move to the segmentation. And you can see the lines that it draws, and this is done automatically for you. We can add another line here to go up and down. And the whole idea here is to have the entire vertebral body within the segmented lines. Once you're happy with the lines, you can then label the spine. And you're telling the computer that this is the L5 vertebral body. One of the most important parts of this next step is looking at this grid here. And I use this grid to make sure that the screws end up in the same relative location, one vertebrae to another. And then I'll move this grid to the middle of the vertebral body and essentially bisect the vertebral body and bisect the epidural canal. I'll then move to the lateral and I'll run this transverse line parallel to the superior end plate and just at the roof of the pedicle here. And if I do that at every vertebral body, the screws, one vertebral body to the next, are going to end up in the same location. Likewise here, I will run this transverse line parallel to that superior end plate. So this is the L4. Then I move to the L5. So once I have the grids in, I go back to the axial image. This is where I typically start. And then we add the screws. So you can see the software places the screws for us in a generic position. And then what I will do is adjust the trajectory to pick the ideal landing spot. The image that you see here now is the full image, multiple layers of the CT cut. The first thing that we can see is that I can get a much longer screw in. I can probably go to 50 millimeter screws and I can do the same on both sides. I can adjust the diameter of the screws down if we want. And then this has given us the trajectory and the angle. I will then scroll through to the midpoint of the screws. So this dotted line is the midpoint of the screw. And at this point, I will begin adjusting the screw position. This little dot up here is my landing spot. And I want to make sure I've got a flat surface to land on. Now, if I pull up the sagittal image, I can tell the screws are too low. So we're going to move them up. and pick up the right side of the screw, move that up. And you can see that as I moved here, the position of the screws changed in all the different planes. So I'm gonna go back to my axial cut and I'm gonna scroll through again to the middle of it. So I can see now that this landing point is gonna be a little vulnerable to skiving, so I'm going to give myself a docking point right in the valley there to get that screw in the ideal position. Likewise here, I'm going to give me just a little bit more. The next step is to ensure that we're not impinging on the proximal or the cephalad facet joint. You can see here the head of this screw is coming a little bit close, and I know I have enough real estate to really move this screw out laterally. So I can move that trajectory to about a 31 degree trajectory, just for the sake of matching it up, I'll move the other one over a bit as well. And that's where I'm gonna want my screws to end up. So there it is in the axial plane. 
then I can come to my sagittal plane and scroll one slice at a time and see exactly where that screw is going to end up. That was the right screw. Now we've got the left screw and we can see we're not impinging on that facet joint. And then I will check the screw position on the coronal cuts as well. And I really like the coronal cuts the best to check the screw position because you can see the facet joints here and you can see that the screw head is well away from the facet joints. And then you can see it's docking on the valley and you can see it coming right down. I'm gonna go back a couple slices right down through the pipe of the pedicle. So I've got a very well-placed screw there. So once I'm happy with the position of the screws in L4, I call up the L5 vertebral body and I go to add the implants. Now you can see the software automatically placed them according to what I planned in L4 and the grid lines that we had. So each subsequent level is much easier to plan as you're going through it. Once I have the screws planned at four and five, you can go to the summary details. And this gives us a whole picture of what we're doing, exactly how they're gonna end up. And you can plan the order of surgical placement of the screws in the operating room. You can start on the right or on the left. You can go one down, you can start at the top, start at the bottom. This is an example of... So this is a case here that I really like to show, and this is one of the adolescent Scully cases. And you can see how thin the pedicles are here. And this would be really, really difficult to cannulate uh, freehand or even with fluoroscopy. And with the preoperative planning, you can see how we're able to absolutely place that screw exactly where we need to. And then here's another short video just on the actual mechanics right. of the screw right. placement. Right. Sorry. This is clearly one of the percutaneous cases that I was doing. This was a 4-5 spondy that we did with a mini open approach for a, a T-lift and then perk screws on one side and the, and the screws were done sort of through the mini open approach on the other side. So we dispatched the robot to the appropriate spot. We placed the guide tube down which has got a blunt cannula, and then I know exactly where that valley is where I docked the screw. Once I've got it seated, and this does take a little bit of feel because you don't want to be sliding off the transverse process. You don't want to be sliding off the side of that facet joint. You then exchange the blunt cannula for the sharp cannula with some teeth that docks you into position. I routinely use an oscillating drill. So as you're drilling, you're feeling and you're sort of tapping. You're always feeling bone in front of you and there's no risk of winding up any soft tissue, particularly the nerves. Then you can place your exchange tube and K-wire down. And at this point, you can use any implant system that you want uh, to get your screw down into position. So there have been many studies over the years looking at the accuracy of the screw placement. Uh, this was actually a cadaveric study that we did in 2012. And th this study kind of um, distracted me and, and, and lowered my self-esteem a bit because we had a number of um, medical students, junior residents, senior residents, as well as fellows and then experienced spine surgeons. And essentially what the study told us that pedicle screw placement accuracy was not dependent on surgeon experience. So now we've got a, a technology that can really level the playing field. And if we adhere to the principles of the technology, everybody can be doing the same type of procedure. 
This was a study by Candlehart a number of years ago where he looked at 57 freehand cases and 55 robotic cases. And he concluded that in the robotic assisted cases, the rate of misplaced screws and duration of interoperative x-rays were significantly lower while the procedure time did not differ significantly. And this was one of the early criticisms of using this technology was that it would make us slower surgeons. And this was with DeVito's study from uh, 2019, where they had 840 cases, 14 hospitals, 3,271 pedicle screws. 98% of those screws were in a good position. And they conclude that robotic assistant offered enhanced performance in spinal surgery when compared to freehand by increasing accuracy and reducing the neurological risks. We've published a number of studies now as well, and this was one of the first ones that we did that we looked at the uh, first set of 102 patients that I operated on, and we had less than 1% of the screws malpositioned. And if you look through the literature with all the other technology at the time, the malposition rate was anywhere from 4 to 15%. So clearly a big difference. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. There isn't anything that is perfect, but it is a dramatic improvement. We also looked at the uh, accuracy and the learning curve. And with uh, our colleagues, we looked at some of the things and looking at the robotic assistance and the screw malposition rates, we sort of determined that it takes about 30 cases to be consistent. But it's not consistent with the technique as much consistent with the planning. And that's what we found here, that as I learned how to plan better, I became better in the operating room with it as well. And then we looked at alternate different approaches, and this is now getting us to the advanced techniques. And we looked at the first 18 patients <clears throat> where I did S2 Ehler Iliac screws, and we found that the accuracy of the screws was very precise. The entry point had deviated a little bit, but I think that that was when I was hooking the rod to the screw, I was plowing that screw a little bit in the sacrum because the distal point of the screws and the trajectory of the screws seemed to be right on. But overall, they were very, very good. And then we've got Canestra's study that was just recently published as well, where they looked at four different methods with robotic guidance, fluoroscopic guidance, freehand. And they saw that robotic guidance decreased the complication and the revision rates in a number of different cohorts, uh, 705 different patients. So this is just one case example that I want to show. This is an adolescent idiopathic curve, a young uh, boy who I had treated, and you can see he had a very rigid curve. Here you can see the preoperative planning, and you can see how I've got my screws placed above and below and what we uh, are trying to achieve with the correction. And then here you can see the actual correction that we were able to achieve from the 52 degrees down to about 12 degrees with screws well-placed, parallel to each other, the spine derotated, and realigning the natural kyphosis that we were looking for. So the advantages of these navigation and robotic techniques minimize the interoperative radiation exposure, improve screw placement and precision. It improves the screw pullout resistance because you've got the screws in a very good position each time. You get much better deformity correction. The preoperative planning does aid in the recognition of anatomic variants, and it does make your uh, exposures far less invasive and does enhance operative efficiency. One of the things that I would always maintain is that robotic assistance is not gonna make a bad surgeon good. What it does is it makes a good surgeon more efficient and more precise. And the lessons that I've learned over the years are the value of preoperative planning in terms of OR efficiency, when the whole team knows exactly what you're gonna do before the case even starts. And when you've already done that surgery in your mind, you get to the operating room and you're able to facilitate it. We are definitely reducing the radiation exposure to the OR team, the patient and the surgeon, and the magic of this technology. Again, we're only limited by our imagination right now. And there is a lot of future potential. And the evolution does continue on where we're integrating semi-active and active robots where we can 
preoperatively plan the decompressions, the robot can facilitate that decompression to really get us the final improved patient outcome that we want. And this is how I see the future of spine surgery. Patient-specific plan, patient-specific implants, disposable instruments, just-in-time delivery to an outpatient center for an efficient, minimally invasive, potentially outpatient type of surgery because we've planned ahead and we've taken advantage of all the technologies. So why navigation and robotics? Well, today, if you're going from home to work every day, uh, no one's really going to use their GPS. But if you're going to a new restaurant ha halfway across town or you're going to visit someone that you've not visited, the first thing you do today is plug into Google Maps or to Waze and figure out how you're going to go there because it's different. It's not something you've done every single day, and it's always different. And I would defy anyone to tell me that in their career, they've done the exact same spine case every single time, every day. So this is why I think robotics and navigation is here to stay, and it is going to help us be better surgeons. So with that, I'd like to thank you all. And we're going to introduce the fellows one at a time to present some cases with some advanced techniques. Alex, you're up. Sounds good. Thanks, Dr. Lieberman. Can everybody hear me? You're good. Great. So um, my name is Alex Satin. I'm one of the TBI fellows. And this evening, I will be presenting a case of robotic-assisted management of spinal metastatic disease. So the patient is a 79-year-old female. Um, she was previously very active, but came to our clinic with worsening low back and left leg pain. Um, roughly seven months prior to her presentation to, to our office, she developed a sudden right lower extremity pain, um, specifically in the hip, and was found to have an impending hip fracture um, with a lytic peritrochanteric uh, lesion. Um, she subsequently underwent intramedullary nailing and radiation and was confirmed to have a lung adenocarcinoma. Um, since that time, she had uh, been diagnosed with um, METs to the choroid plexus and underwent radiation therapy. And as far as systemic treatment, she was currently being treated um, with a monoclonal antibody. Um, so when she came to us, she had some mild back pain, but it had acutely worsened over the last 10 days um, with left lower extremity pain um, down to the knee. Um, it was minimal relief um, from any kind of uh, narcotics or anti-inflammatories. So um, you can see that uh, she was in quite a bit of pain and disabled. Um, she had difficulty uh, rising from a seated position and ambulating and um, was, you know, very uncomfortable in her appearance. In regards to her exam, she did have some proximal weakness in the left lower extremity, as well as some uh, decreased sensation um, in her thigh. Um, here are her x-rays, uh, AP and lateral uh, lumbar films. She does have some degenerative changes throughout the lumbar spine. Um, she uh, has a pretty preserved sagittal parameters. Um, on the AP, you can see that she has a slight coronal uh, abnormality in the lumbar spine with an apex around uh, L2-3. Um, if you look closely, you can see that the cortical margins of L2 are um, kind of eroded and have lost some of their um, you know, cortical margins, and uh, there is a slight bit of lateral listhesis at this level. Here's her MRI, and uh, we'll go through this. Um, sagittal and axial T2 cuts. Um, as we go through here at L2, you can see um, that she has a large destructive lytic lesion um, on the left side of L2. Um, it does cause uh, some lateral recess and foraminal stenosis at this level, and there is a soft tissue component that extends into uh, left psoas muscle, and we'll come back up on the MR here and see the, uh, the lesion again. Um, 
We also obtained a CAT scan. And uh, as we scroll through, you can see the, the CT redemonstrates this large lytic lesion um, in L2, um, particularly on the left side. Um, there's quite a bit of bony destruction that we can see. Um, and it, it clearly extends into the left pedicle. And extends into the soft tissues. Sorry. So, um, in light of the uh, patient's complaints, exams, and in imaging finding, we felt that uh, surgery was necessary at this point. Our plan was to perform a stabilization and separation surgery to provide pain relief and neurologic improvement um, while limiting the interruption of the patient's systemic therapy and allowing for early adjuvant radiation. Um, in light of this, we plan for a T12 to L4 robotic-assisted percutaneous pedicle screws um, with facet fusions, cement augmentation, as well as a left L2 transpedicular decompression um, partial corpectomy. So here's our preoperative plan, as Dr. Lieberman had showed in his talk. Um, if you look closely, um, particularly on the lateral projection, you can see that we also planned for um, facet drilling trajectories, um, and I'll explain what we did for, for that. So here's an intraoperative uh, picture of us doing the facet drilling um, over the two millimeter drill. We pass an eight millimeter actually from the DHS um, um, kit um, and trays uh, over the uh, two millimeter drill bit and uh, into the facet joint and uh, pack bone graft into the tracks. Uh, here are our post-operative standing AP and lateral scoliosis films. You can see the cement augmentation and um, the hardware that was placed. I'll quickly go through the uh, CT scan here. This is a post-operative CT scan that shows uh, our hardware to be in good alignment. Um, we'll go slowly so you can see the um, facet drilling trajectories as well as the decompression that was performed. There's our decompression at L2 on the left side. And then in the more caudal levels, you can see here on the right and then the left, that's where our facet drilling took place with bone graft. There on the right again, left here, and then the end of the contract. So uh, post-operatively, the patient's left uh, lower extremity pain um, improved. Uh, she had a lot more stability and was uh, able to get out of the chair a lot easier and ambulate. She was discharged home on post-op day three and was undergoing her systemic therapy as well as adjuvant radiation therapy. Um, six weeks post-operatively, she did develop a um, L5 superior end plate fracture. Um, biopsy was negative for any kind of metastatic disease, and this was presumed to be post-radiation uh, necrosis. So here's her 90-day follow-up. Um, you can see that she's had significant improvement in her pain as well as disability. Um, you can see the cement augmentation that was subsequently done at L5. Um, you know, in, in, I thought this was an interesting case for a number of reasons. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the use of robotics um, for the treatment of metastatic disease. And, you know, there's been um, some debate recently as to whether or not um, open fusion surgery was necessary in this patient population, given the morbidity of performing an open fusion and poor potential for osseous healing in light of the patient's reduced life expectancy as well as poor biology. Um, so this was a study from South Korea where they looked at 136 patients uh, with average 16-month follow-up. And um, they reported successful outcomes with very low complication rates after non-fusion instrumentation surgery for patients with spinal metastatic disease, and even among patients who live um, more than six months. Um, so they, the conclusion of their paper um, was that uh, non-fusion surgery may be sufficient for the large majority of patients with spinal mets. 
Um, you know, I was wondering if I, anybody from the panel or audience had some thoughts about this. And I think being able to do the um, fusion minimally invasively with um, the technique as described is kind of a happy uh, medium or reasonable compromise between a large open technique as well as, uh, you know, just internal instrumentation uh, without fusion. And then, you know, I think also in this instance, um, the, the pedicle screw trajectory from the contralateral side was particularly helpful in planning our decompression and minimizing the soft tissue exposure. Thank you, Alex. Uh, is there any any comment from the from the panelists on on that one? Why don't we move on to John? John, why don't you present your case? All righty, get to the slides here. Great. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the advantage, particularly uh, to preoperatively planning, as Dr. Lieberman kind of outlined earlier, with uh, robotic guidance and uh, really what the preoperative plan buys for you. So briefly, we'll just talk about um, kind of a pre-publication paper here where we're uh, able to look at a bunch of prospectively collected information on patients that we use robotic guidance systems for, plan the trajectories for the screws, and then execute that intraoperatively. I mean, you can see 31 patients here uh, with the mean age there, 53. You can see their uh, diagnosis at the bottom there. Um, this is really kind of the, the meat of it, uh, really want to present a case, so I just kind of jumped to the results here, but essentially you can see the coronal and the sagittal numbers, what the pre-op numbers were, what we planned them to be, and then what their post-op numbers were. When we look at what that actually comes out to, it's the, the coronal cob where, you know, about seven degrees plus or minus six and sagittal is nine degrees plus or minus six for the final uh, result compared to what we planned. So, you know, this is early on, obviously, where we've evolved quite a bit, as Dr. Lieberman had pointed out since the beginning. But, you know, this is a, just a small study here, but showing kind of what we're able to do. I think a lot of us uh, would be kind of surprised if we measured uh, the freehand screws and bending of the rods and what that angle was versus what we measured on a computer uh, ahead of time. So I think, you know, this is uh, positive data for us that the robot's helping us be a little more precise. Um, so this was a kind of interesting case that we had recently. 74 young uh, year young guy with a AFib was a smoker, had some radiculopathy, but back pain for a long time. Had tried all the normal non-operative stuff, and we elected to proceed after our normal kind of long conversation uh, about uh, the risks of surgery and benefits and where he is in his life and what his goals are um, to proceed with surgery in his case. So this is his preoperative uh, full spine image. You can see his deformity there. I have some closer pictures here I'm gonna show you. So this is the, the picture you saw earlier in the video with Dr. Lieberman where when you finish planning all the screws, you get this kind of summary page where you can see from your AP and from your lateral where the screws are gonna go. This is with the patient in their alignment right now. As you can tell from the rods on the kind of the AP or the PA view, that's a total nightmare to bend those rods in the sagittal and coronal plane. And that's really not our goal here. Our goal is to get him to the alignment we want. So it's just connecting the heads of the screws there in that picture. But if you'll notice the picture on the left and the picture on the right where they don't line up, if you use the X-Align software here, this tells us by slicing the image in between the vertebral bodies, just like he did when he was running the digital slicing, you can see the image on the right kind of meshes it together if it were to be aligned based on our parameters filled in over here, where you can type in how much uh, you want the cob angle to be, of course, zero in this case, or how much we want the sagittal angle or alignment to be from level to level. And this gives us an idea of where we're going to be when we put the rods in, when we bring the screws around, derotate the vertebral bodies, and get everything lined up the way that we want. So in this case, this is our post-op uh, standing x-ray. So we put, uh, as you saw the trajectories earlier, we have a bunch of screw trajectories in there, S2A eyes on the bottom, and right above that is actually an SI fusion uh, implant. And then I'll show you, and this uh, animation worked perfect, and here it's going to miss a little, but then I'll show you. So right here, you can see that in this case, you know, we're very happy with how accurately we were able to put those screws when we compared it to our preoperative plan. Um, you know, as Dr. Lieberman pointed out, it's not gonna make you great if you're not a good surgeon, 
But if you're good, this will help you just accomplish the things that you're otherwise trying to accomplish without the robot or with other forms of navigation more precisely because we were able to see ahead of time uh, where, where exactly this was going to be aligned. And as you can see, all the implants there are pretty close in the ballpark. Um, the other really interesting thing that is honestly, I think, the most valuable part of this technology, in my opinion, is we take an x-ray after surgery and or after we're done putting the implants in. In the beginning, we take this x-ray, there's no implants. The machine uses this reference array with a plain film, compares it to the CT, and that's how the robot understands its position in three-dimensional space. Here, we take the same x-ray with the implants in. We then use that to register the robot, but what we're really doing is we want to check our trajectory that it was showing us on a plane film with the film with the implants now in it. So you can see on that top view, that's our planned trajectories for the SI implants and S2AI. The bottom view is an oblique shot of that, but essentially confirms for us in a better way than just a plane film showing you that the implants are safe, that they actually matched our planned trajectory. So your ability to confirm implant location without an intraoperative CT scan is right here. It's two fluoro shots. So for me, I thought that was a really nice thing to have, where not only do you feel confident the robot's helping you put it in in the correct trajectory, but you can actually check that before you're done without a ton of radiation for everyone. So, you know, the adaptability of the preoperative planning is really a perk. If you get intraop and you don't like something or something's come up anatomy-wise you didn't anticipate, you can change it. You can go to that same planning screen intraoperatively and move the screw around. You can change your trajectory, size, anything you could plan preoperatively, you can change intraoperatively. You can have the rep do it under your direction, or you can do it yourself on the touch screen, which we, we've done some of both, and it's very helpful. Um, and then in this case, we did the SI fusion. We kind of put those implants in. We've had a couple cases recently where because of the height of the PSIS or whatever, weren't quite able to get the trajectory we wanted. So we just converted on the fly to let's do an outside in SI fusion. And that was really not a problem with a few minutes of planning. The robot arm was moving for us to get us where we wanted to be. So I think takeaways here, when you do the pre-op plan, you're doing it at home, you're doing it in the office, you're not doing it with the patient under anesthesia. You can take as Dr. Lieberman says all the time, you know, sometimes you got to set a clock because if you're type A, like a lot of us are, you can spend three hours doing this if you want, just because it's kind of fun to do. Um, but you're not doing it with the pressure of the patient asleep and I need to hurry and let's just get this over with. You can take your time. You can also plan things like your osteotomy cuts. As I showed you with the X align, you can see what the alignment's gonna look like afterwards. You can see what the alignment's gonna look like after you take out a wedge of bone. Is 10 degrees enough? Do I need to do a PSO or a VCR? You can plan all of those things ahead of time and it's not a guess. You're not using a rule of thumb that this osteotomy buys me this many degrees. You can actually measure it. Um, certainly evaluating whether or not an inner body implant would be helpful or necessary for your correction and stability is a little bit easier to understand in the robotic planning. Um, and then anatomic issues that, you know, we all, like Dr. Lieberman says, a lot of us kind of feel like, well, I can put the images up and I'll look at it before the case and feel pretty confident. But, you know, in the cervical spine, we wouldn't do that, right? We look at all the vasculature. If we're going into here in the lumbar spine, we do the same thing. Well, the bony anatomy and certainly revision cases it's helpful to make yourself go through all the steps. Nothing makes you go through all the steps more than actually looking at every screw when you're planning that trajectory of it and seeing the anatomy around it. So it's just a reminder to slow down, anticipate problems ahead of time. Pedicle's too small. You know that ahead of time that you're going to put in a four or five screw when you normally do sixes, and your rep and everyone in the room knows the size of screw you're going to put in at every level before the case, so it's always there. So I think it helps you avoid problems that you might otherwise run into, makes you feel more confident about the position of the screws, and gives you the ability to actually verify that at the end of the case. So all those things together, I think, kind of add to the, uh, the advantages of planning preoperatively. Thank you, John. Great uh, presentation. Uh, why don't we move on, and uh, Antonio, uh, introduce yourself and present your case. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Antonio Webb, one of the other fellows here. Uh, this gentleman is a 75-year-old gentleman who presented with uh, worsening neck pain and headaches since 2015. He had a prior uh, fusion of C4, C5, as well as C6, C7 um, in 2013, and he did well for about two years. 
And then two years after that, he presented with this uh, new onset of uh, neck pain that was different from his initial neck pain it was associated with this band-like headache. He did have some progressive uh, weakness in his left upper extremity, as well as some occasional uh, shooting pain into his left uh, arm. So here's his uh, past surgical history. He's had multiple uh, surgeries. He's had a uh, lower lumbar effusion, and these are his uh, medical history, uh, past medical history, GERD, elevated cholesterol, hypothyroidism, hypertension. So on um, physical exam, um, he was seated pretty comfortably. Uh, he did have difficulty rising to an upright uh, position from his chair. Um, he had difficulty with uh, his heel to toe uh, gait, uh, single stance, as, as well as uh, we observed that he had a wide base gait. Uh, he, wears, he was wearing a, a cervical uh, brace. Um, he, this gentleman is a, a true Texan. He's a, a farmer and was wearing his brace to keep his uh, head up while he was uh, driving his tractor. So he was uh, pretty active uh, when he came to see us. His uh, surgical incisions were uh, well healed, and he did stand in a, a stoop forward posture. Uh, he has some difficulty with his uh, balance. His cervical spine, he was pretty non-tender, but he did have some painful and restricted um, range of motion in his cervical spine. Uh, you can see his uh, motor exam. He, he did have some weakness in his uh, left bi biceps as well as triceps and his hand grip. And uh, his sensation and reflexes were um, uh, pretty normal. Uh, up until this point, he, he, he had the prior surgery, which he did get better for about two years, and then he st started having this new pain. He's tried injections in the past as well as uh, oral pain medications, and all of these um, you know, did not give him the relief that he had wished for. This is a AP and lateral flex X of the cervical spine. You can see that there is a loss of uh, normal cervical lordosis. Um, he does have uh, implants at C4, C5, as well as uh, C6, T7. There appears, appears to be a auto fusion of 5, 6, as well as some lithesis of uh, C2 and C3, as well as uh, C7 and uh, T1. CT scan uh, confirms this, that he uh, had pseudoarthrosis of those uh, prior ACDF uh, levels, as well as the, the lithesis of C2, C3, C3, C4, as well as T7, uh, T1. And then his MRI uh, shows that he does have some stenosis uh, bilaterally at these levels as well. So this gentleman who presented, um, who was wearing a, a neck uh, C collar due to his uh, dropped uh, head, he had uh, band-like uh, symptoms of headaches, uh, progressive weakness. He was myelopathic uh, on exam. So we, we felt the best thing to uh, do for this gentleman was offer him an operation. We felt that the uh, best operation for him would be a posterior. Um, and our plan, you see the preoperative plan here is uh, from C2 to uh, T2 with uh, some Smith pedosteotomies to realign his spine and um, to get his uh, head back over his uh, pelvis and shoulder. These are the intraoperative uh, images here. Uh, you can see the uh, pedicle screw that pedicle screws that replace it at uh, these levels, uh, good correction of his cervical lordosis um, at, at, um, intraoperatively. And this is the uh, postoperative uh, CT scan that uh, confirms um, accurate uh, placement uh, using the um, robot to place the uh, pedicle screws. And th th this is his uh, postoperative AP and lateral of his cervical spine. You can see he's uh, pretty happy with his glasses uh, that he's wearing now. Uh, the patient did well postoperatively. You can see the uh, VAS and as well as the improved uh, NDI. Um, and um, this is a, a quick study that a retrospective study that we were able to look at um, looking at robotic guided placement of cervical pedicle screws. Um, as we know that the pedicle screws uh, have superior biomechanical pullout strength and stability. And then due to the uh, complex and variable anatomy um, placed in pedicle screws, most people these days uh, would opt for lateral mass. Uh, but we looked at uh, our experience uh, placing uh, the cervical pedicle screws uh, with our 
uh, robots. This is a this was a retrospective uh, review. Uh, we looked at um, consecutive patients who underwent cervical pedicle screw placement, and then a postoperative CT scan um, was uh, reviewed. We uh, fused the uh, preoperative CT scan with the uh, plan uh, cervical pedicle screws to the uh, postoperative CT, and then we measured the deviation um, in the axial as well as the uh, sagittal plane, and then reviewed the uh, medical charts to uh, see if there are any technical issues or intraoperative complications that were observed. So this is the uh, the planned um, uh, cervical pedicle screw trajectory as well as the actual uh, screw uh, placement. And you can see that um, uh, the robotic uh, arm was uh, really accurate in, in placing these screws here. Uh, this is the uh, demographics of the uh, patient. Most of them were in their 60s, uh, a good mix of female and male. Uh, most of the, the pathology was cervical uh, spondylosis. And then what we found it was that there were no intraoperative uh, complications uh, related to the placement of these uh, cervical pedicle screws. Um, the, the robotic guidance was successful in all of the screws. Um, there were 10 pedicle screws that had um, you know, less than a one millimeter uh, breach, which was uh, not significant. And this is just a, a breakdown of the uh, the levels that the pedicle screws were placed at. You can see there were five on the, the right side as well as uh, five on the left side that we uh, measured that there was uh, less than a one millimeter uh, breach. That just uh, shows that those uh, deviations there. So basically this study showed that uh, robotic guided cervical pedicle screw placement is feasible with, the, uh, with clinical clinically acceptable results. Uh, the medical, medial pedicle breaches uh, did not result in any clinical uh, consequences. And, um, and that is, uh, that's it. Thank you, Antonio. And to keep, uh, to keep things rolling for even uh, more advanced type approaches, uh, Abby, do you wanna present your case next? Abby, you've got to unmute yourself. Okay. There you are. Can everyone hear me now? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Abby Gandhi. I'm one of the other fellows. I'd like to present a uh, quick case, percutaneous pars lysis fixation uh, using robotic guidance. Um, well. Actually, can I go back? Let's see. So this is a page 16 year old uh, teenager uh, she had greater than two years of back pain, uh, worse in the last few months. Her pain was worse on the right versus the left. Uh, that's important to remember. You'll see in the next few slides why. Um, she was unable to participate in, in some sports, and she's a very active individual. Um, she's tried multiple modalities of non-operative management. Um, given her age, she doesn't really have a significant medical history. She is neurovascularly intact, and um, her BMI is with the normal limits. Uh, these are the AP lateral and full length films um, of this patient. Um, if you look at the 5S1 level, she appears to have a pars defect, which is better delineated on uh, the axial cut of this uh, CT scan. Um, as you can see, her pain is, her symptoms are mostly on the right side. However, the defect is on the left. Um, you see a lot of stress reaction in the bone on the right, and that's basically what her primary complaint was. Um, at this point, I just wanted to give a brief background of spondylolysis in the literature. You know, there's a very small incidence, three to 10%. Uh, most of them are managed with non-operative modalities and uh, most patients do better with just that. Uh, however, when it is refractory to such um, non-operative uh, uh, management, you, you have to consider some operative techniques. And the most common one is the Bucks technique where you do a direct screw fixation across uh, the defect with or without bone graft. Um, you also have the option to do tension band wiring with hook fixation, um, inner body fusion. Uh, and typically these methods achieve more than 70% satisfaction according to the uh, literature. Um, you know, it's, it, ideally you'd like it to be more, you know, closer to 100% um, given the very localized and focal nature of these defects. You know, in our particular case, we decided to approach this using uh, the ro uh, robotic um, arm. Um, these are the preoperative uh, films. 
preoperative planning slides. Um, if you look on the right, uh, there are two different trajectories, one for the lag screw fixation across the defect and another to decorticate uh, the area of the parse defect, so to facilitate fusion. Um, this is a sagittal slide of the preoperative planning as well, as, you, as you've seen uh, Dr. Lieberman demonstrate in this video. Um, these are some of the interoperative pictures. On the bottom right, you have um, the exchange uh, sheets that we um, uh, place after drilling the correct path. And um, the arm is, we're just confirming uh, using registration that um, the surface map is, uh, is uh, co uh, cor you know, correlates quite well with, uh, with the preoperative uh, CT scan and plan. Um, this is, sorry, let's go back. Um, this is the video, if it works, um, of, of um, the post-operative uh, plan, you know, as John Burleson kind of demonstrated, you know, we, we use this to correlate um, how well are our screws uh, with uh, with the preoperative plan, and as you can see, it's it's quite well correlated, and we're very happy with the fixation. Um, these are the post-op uh, films, three-month post-op films. Uh, we recently saw her in clinic, and she's doing extremely well. Um, I forgot to mention it was also an outpatient procedure, so uh, you know, 16-year-old, we we you know, we'd like to do a very minimally invasive. Uh, Is that screw on the left or the right? Uh, it's on the it's on the left. But you said the pain was on the right. Exactly. So, you know, I kind of alluded to that in, in the beginning. Um, sh even though the defect was in, on the left, um, most of her stress reaction and her clinical um, symptoms were on the right. And she's doing great. She doesn't have any right back pain anymore, right lumbar back pain. And I think uh, the defect was kind of stressing that right side of the arch more than in the left and causing her the symptoms. So that, that takes uh, a lot of guts to treat a right-sided lesion, which was the stress reaction with a left-sided screw. I mean, you may have gotten away not, with something. Not really, here. Scott. I, I've seen that a couple of times before where they've had a defect on one side and a stress reaction that was painful on the other side. So you know, I've also sense. seen, and I also see if you wait to their fracture the right side, the pain goes away. Well, but this gal paneling was refractory. Yeah, that, I, that, that does. Like, sound I, like, the like I said, I, I don't know that I, I don't know that I would show this on your board review. I don't know in your collection period. This is this is a little bit out there. No, no, it's not out there, Scott. I mean, why to do you treat, say to that? treat a right to treat a right sided back pain lesion with a left sided mature your post, pars? Your posterior arch is is feeling the stress. One side is broken. The other side is is taking the blunt of the uh, mechanical. It's a contralateral stress. sclerotic pedicle, which is described as a pain generator, Scott. So, right. No, yeah, I, so. I mean, I, I get that the pain generator is from the contralateral side, but I've not seen before treating the asymptomatic pars defect, you know, destabilizing it as as the ultimate treatment. I mean, I'd love to I see some long term. I don't think I've ever heard you say just uh, to hold off on surgery until you get better. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the no, first time I've ever heard you say that. <laughs> for, for these lesions, yes. You know, oh, come on. Man, let's, let's keep this internal debate for, for one of our <laughs> other conferences and let Abby finish the case. You know, I think one of the advantage of, of this, uh, this left-sided approach only for fixation for Dr. Blumenthal, I think if you had to go back and she wasn't feeling much better. You know, we had to send her, we sent her home the same day because she was feeling great. Um, you could always, you know, um, it's not ideal, but we can always come back because there's not much tissue uh, compromise and and, uh, and pain from uh, from dissection, uh, large open dissection either. So I think that's one of the advantages, a great advantage of this robot um, technique. So um, that concludes our presentation. Thank you, Abby. We're, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to ask Domingo to present his case. Domingo? Hello, my name's Domingo Molina. I'm uh, one of the TBI fellows. We'll run through this real quickly. Uh, this is more of a trauma application uh, with um, CT navigation. So this is a 54-year-old male, history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia several other uh, comorbidities, uh, lost control of his ATV, uh, which rolled on top of him. 
uh, you had baseline, right greater than left radiculopathy, as well as some right S1 paresthesias. Um, he had been a previous patient of, at a TBI. Uh, he did was moving all extremities upon trauma evaluation. No saddle anesthesia, positive rectal tone, um, and we did obtain an MRI. Um, plan was, um, patient was found to have an L1 burst fracture with significant retropulsion. Uh, he had a prior L4 to S1 fusion. And so plan for this was a posterior spinal fusion to each end of the pelvis, uh, which included uh, both the fractured L1 burst um, as well as extension above and below the fusion. Uh, we intended to use ligament ataxis uh, via posterior instrumentation um, as well as assess uh, the uh, instrumentation via intraop CT spit. So these are our pre-op images. On the left, uh, we can see an axial cut, a significant retropulsion, and burst-style fracture. Uh, same thing on a sagittal. Um, some kyphosis, um, and then well as the MRI images, uh, there were mixed uh, physical exam findings with concern for um, injury to his conus, uh, given the level of the L1 burst fracture. Uh, so this played into part of our uh, surgical planning. Um, so thoughts were to possibly um, need to decompress uh, via laminectomy as well as um, instrumentation. So the nice thing about the CT navigation uh, intraop is that we're able to assess our ligament attacks and reduction of the burst fracture. Uh, so on the left, you see the pre-op images um, with our initial scan prior to instrumentation. Um, the uh, pic image on the right is our post-instrumentation scan. As you can see now, uh, we got a significant reduction of the uh, retropulse fragments. Uh, so this... Uh, uh, allowed us to not have to go and uh, do a decompression in addition to instrumentation. So these are post-op images, uh, given the um, idea that uh, he was somewhat of a heavier uh, patient, um, over 300 pounds. Um, he had a previous uh, lower lumbar effusion. Extending the burst fracture up and down two levels would have given us, um, like I said, unfortunately, having to extend his fusion, uh, both cranial and caudal uh, T10 to the pelvis. Uh, Post-operatively, patient did well. I was ambulating um, day one after surgery um, and uh, went to rehab shortly thereafter. So. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, well, thank you, fellows, for putting those cases together. That's uh, really the collective experience of the fellows at uh, our trauma center and at uh, our other hospitals where we're using a lot of the more advanced navigation and robotic techniques. Uh, for those who want to stick around for a couple more minutes, if there are any questions or comments, I think we've, we've outlined what the, uh, the future is going to be. There was uh, one comment uh, in the chat session about if everybody learns to put these screws in with uh, robotics only, you're gonna learn, you're gonna forget or not be able to do the classic techniques. And uh, absolutely, that's a concern. And I, I really don't know what the answer is, but my usual rebuttal to that comment is, how many young orthopedists know how to do an open knee ligament repair or an open knee meniscectomy? Uh, that of itself is a surgical skill and talent that has evolved out and maybe as the future goes um, we're going to be having other technologies where we're not even going to be placing pedicle screws so this is just another step in the evolution i invite any other comments in the last couple minutes from any other panelists if anyone uh, has anything to add to to our session did hey, you see that last comment did you see that last chat we have a uh, doctor viewing this from yemen that's cool. Hey, Izzy, I just want to I just want to make a comment. First of all, I think this is terrific. And secondly, what you said about the future of robotics and navigation is absolutely true. I'm not worried about the surgeon not learning the open techniques. I used to be concerned that when we went to perk screws that the the fellows wouldn't learn the open techniques. The bottom line is that the technology, the navigation, and the imaging will make up for what they don't have with their open techniques. It's very, very rare they're going to have to do anything open into the future. 
So, you know, that doesn't bother me. That's the wave. And as you said, nobody does an open meniscectomy. Every does, but he does it, you know, arthroscopically, and they're looking at the video screen. So this is the wave. This is, uh, you know, what our guys are going to be doing 20 years from now. There'll be very little open surgery. Everything will be MIS. No, I, I, I agree with Rick. I mean, I, we, you know, we, we have a, a limited scope in our practice right now of the endoscopic discectomies. But I think the way we do discectomies, you know, the, the senior guys, the way we do them now, I think, you know, we're not going to, well, the field is not going to be doing them in a few years. It's all going to be different variations of, of MIS. And, you know, frankly, if I need a discectomy now, I'd probably, you know, get someone who was good at the tube to do it through a tube. And, and, you know, as far as not understanding the open anatomy, you know, by doing it endoscopic or these other uh, minimally invasive techniques, you're learning the anatomy from a different viewpoint. You're like learning from a different perspective. So, um, you know, you guys are going to do great. I, I always tell the fellows that what you learn today is, are not the same case you're going to be doing 10 and 20 years from now. Is it, if I may, is it my make a comment? I first want to applaud you for staying with this technology for literally what seems decades. I remember a lab in early 2000. So you've come a long way. And my question really is, with all the trials and tribulations I'm sure you've gone through, can you give a few pertinent comments on what not to do to the early user today, the guy who gets in, what should he not be doing? Uh, Neil, thank you for that vote of confidence and, and for that uh, recognition. I really appreciate that. Uh, if we weren't in public sphere, I'd uh, take my shirt off and show you the scars and arrows in my back <laughs> over the years collected with this technology. Yeah, then, yes. uh, there, there are things not to do. The first and foremost is don't get frustrated with any new technology. You just have to be patient with it. And, and if you're patient... You will learn the subtleties and you will make the technology work for you instead of you working for the technology. The second, and these are the, the typical spine surgery motherhood statements, don't start with the toughest case that you may not be able to bail out with. Start with the simple cases. Start with things that you know that you can do. Start with a couple open cases so you get the idea and then graduate yourself as you go to it. And then the third thing is always have plan B, plan C in your back pocket. If you come into the operating room prepared with plan A, in your mind, you've already got plan B. If this doesn't work, I know what I'm going to do. If this doesn't work, I know what I'm going to do. So if you come into it in that fashion, you're going to be successful and your patient outcome is going to be better because you will encounter difficulties. And last thing is know the technology. You have to know that technology inside and out. You have to know the software. You have to know which buttons to push. You have to know which piece of equipment. You cannot rely on an equipment tech, a company rep, or uh, your scrub tech who may not be able to hold his bladder long enough, who has to run to the men's room uh, as soon as you're about to do the, the most critical part of the case. Well so know your technology so that you're never, um, never reliant on anybody else when you're doing these things. Thanks, Izzy. And thanks to the five fellows. Uh, we're going to miss you guys. Uh, two weeks to graduation. It's hard to believe it, but... Uh, uh, this is a really nice graduation present uh, that Dr. Uh, Lieberman tossed to you. So thank you for, for being with us. Good luck to everybody. Yes. Great job, uh, guys. All the great fellas job. did a great job. And thanks, thanks. And thanks to all our participants and to the Seattle Science Foundation folks again. This is a great series. And, and don't forget, everybody. To, and don't forget to sign everybody. up for your CMEs, 462. Right. Stay safe. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.